I am Gogonte Hezekiah Ama. I am a biochemist and I teach at Babcock University. I have a family that used to be of three children, but now two children. But before the three children, we had a girl that was born. All of us were happy that this gift have come to spice up the family experience. But few moments after delivery, we lost the child. Um, the cause we couldn't tell. Then two years later, we had Prince Ntonyem Gogonte, who became the first child and the first son. We also had two others, peace and success. I love all of them, just like the mother too will love them. And it was a good family. I, like every father would, want the child to learn as much as so he can fit better into the society. So each time I go to anywhere I want to go to that I feel is important to go with me. If I want to undertake some adventures, we discuss together. The children also bring their opinion and we share together. If it makes meaning, we adopt their opinion. And that was the experience I had with Prince who was the eldest among all of them. He was fond of a little brother that grew up with me and they were like friends. Prince and I we were so close. On one of the occasions, we were, link, we were looking for where to get for a permanent accommodation, a permanent residence, and he gave his opinion during the family meeting that he would love a place that is closest to the church. So we moved about three sites and he made his choice and his choice became the ruling one since by the future he presented, which we are convinced of, which is proximity to the church, so that he and the younger ones could go to church programs, even if the mother and I are not around. So that became so appealing to us, looking at it, that is coming from, as at that time, he was nine year old, a nine year old child. So his choice of location was adopted by the family. And um, one of the last moments we shared together with Prince, who is now late, the first son of the family as it were, was when he wrote during his assignment of mentorship that I, the father, I am his mentor. I was so touched. I went to the room. I knelt down before our bed and I lifted my hands up and I said, God, I am full of flowers, but this boy could look at me and say, I am his mentor and he could be bold enough to read it out before my hearing. Please help me never to disappoint this boy in any way. That he will not look back and say, Father, I am disappointed in you. It is only you who can help me to truly be his mentor that I will not lead him astray. Two weeks later, we were on our way to the farm. Usually we go to farms on Sundays we had um, a, a subsistence farm where we grow crops, specifically fruits, and that day we were going to pick some fruits like pineapple, like purple, plantain, and banana. On our way going, we choose to branch off the site which he chose for the family permanent residency to look around and then to check the boundary lines. After a few hours, we left on the way to the farm like few, few, few minutes, like five minutes away from our takeoff point, just at a bend, a vehicle was coming with horrible speed. It was very clear that the vehicle has lost control of the steering and it was swerving to the different side of the road. In the vehicle, we were four. I was driving, Prince was seated right behind me. And there were two other young children also with me. One of them a girl who is the only child of my younger brother. The other one, our last born, that circumstance permits that he be like my child because he has grown up with me. But he is my child, I would say. He has spent virtually all his lifetime with me. 
And all of a sudden, I couldn't help it. It was a headlong collision. A few moments away, the vehicle busted into flame. I never knew that the vehicle was even in flames. I tried to pull my leg, my leg was stopped. I pulled it harder and I heard some noise. I could hear the sound of my voice, of the voice of my son screaming for help. Daddy, daddy, somebody help. Fire, somebody help. Then the other girl too was screaming with him. But the next boy, our Jikatalem, I didn't hear his voice. So I was offered to be taken to the hospital. But I was looking at my children. What about my children? I saw them, as I turned, I saw them on the ground. Some onlookers had come to offer some rescues. They opened the door, they brought them out. There was this particular woman who was running from a distance with a jerry can of water. An average, a middle-aged woman. And she was shouting, where are you? Come and help these people, come and help these people. Come and help these people. That woman was the first to get to the vehicle and she was trying to quench the fire before others came to join a fort with her. It was not long, a motorbike came around and I jumped on the motorbike. I never felt much pains, but I was just feeling tired. I never knew I had fractures. But a man was shouting, don't, don't drive him alone, don't drive him alone to the hospital. He could fall, he could fall off the motorbike. Somebody should sit behind him. And that man was an instrument of God because it was very glaring along the way that I wouldn't have been able to sit all alone unaided to the hospital. A young man, Hope Umo, sat behind me and supported me while the bike rode me off to the hospital. Just before the takeoff, I was asking, what about my children? I saw a man that I could recognize. I had had some contact with him before that time, who seemed to have been coming from a journey, who branched off also to offer some rescue help. He was giving the assurance while he was also carrying one of the children to the vehicle, the girl. A few moments as I arrived at the hospital, I also saw my children in the hospital. My son Prince was specifically asking, where is my father? My father was in that vehicle with me. Where is my father? My father was in that vehicle with me. And he was also groaning in pains. I responded, son, I'm fine, I am here. Son, I'm fine, I'm here. But he was not convinced. He told the nurses that nobody should touch him until he sees his father. So they offered to wheel him to me. And he was satisfied. He saw me and I saw him. I said, son, be strong. We'll come out of this stronger. I never knew that was the last moment I was going to be sharing with my son. I saw them wheel past me, one after the other, in the open world of the accident and emergency unit of the hospital. The response was swift. A lot of medical personnel rallied around us to intervene. But I could not bear the pains of my children. And I offered a word of prayer. God, please help these children. If it will require that I die and they survive, so be it. But don't let me lose any of them. It was not long. I was in between consciousness and being unconscious. When my consent was sought to transfer them, to another medical facility, also a tertiary medical facility, with better facilities to handle bonds. They had greater percentage of bonds than I did. I wouldn't know when the ambulance left. It was in the hospital as they were about to remove my clothes that I know that I had some bonds. I never felt the pains of the bonds. It was only the slit on my feet that I could feel the pains so severely. I never also knew that I had fractures. How I was able to come out of the vehicle with fractured bones, 
it is only by God's intervention because I have no words to explain how that could happen. But I remember I struggled out of the windscreen. So in the hospital when they were to remove my clothes, I screamed, please don't remove those clothes. All of those places are hurting. Just tear off the clothes. And that was when I could know I had bonds. So the children were two of the children, Prince and Esther. Esther, my younger brother's only child, were transferred to the next medical facility. While the other boy, a Catalan, who is like my first child, who grew up with me by virtue of circumstance and I remained at the initial hospital we were taken to. From there, all of us, the two of us recovered. The following day, that was the Monday, the accident happened on a Sunday, 2nd of February, 2020. On the 3rd of February, in the afternoon, I couldn't bear it not seeing my son with me. I asked to find out that all is well. They promised assuredly that my son will come back fine. But I had a dream at about 2 p.m. of that day. And in that dream, my son was waving at me, telling me bye, and was running away from me. I tried all within my strength to run after him, but I couldn't catch up with him, and he would not look in my direction either. As I woke up, it ran through my mind that I may never see my son again. And I started singing. But of course, it was a sorrowful tune. And I said the word of prayer, God, I pray that you bring back my son strong and alive for me so that we can reunite again. But if you will bring him back vegetative at the mercy of several and endless medical intervention, Please, Father, that pains of emotion, I can't bear it. It will be much more than I can bear. Please, if that will be the case, take his life. But if you will bring him back safe and sound, and when he's discharged, that will be all. No endless medical intervention can keep him alive for me. A few hours after I made the prayer, at about 4 p.m. that same day, I had another dream where he was dressed in his very first uniform, the very first day he went to school. And in, that, and in that dream, fire was burning and separated my son and I. I was beside the vehicle in that dream in which we had the accident, and he was on the other side with some dry foliage burning heavily and separating us. I made an attempt to run through the fire to get hold of him and to bring him. I couldn't. He was standing with his two hands folded around him. So that dawned on me that I would never see my child again. A few hours afterward, I was transferred to the male surgical ward. I asked about my son. I got all assurance he was fine. But on the Wednesday following that day, my wife had to leave the hospital ward from where she was taking care of me to get some stuffs from nearby market so she could prepare me some meal, including foods as recommended by the team managing my case. That morning, I busted into tears and I wept bitterly. All along, I wouldn't want to weep because that would be too grievous for my wife to bear. A lady came in and saw me weeping and asked me, why are you weeping? You have survived it up to today. Today is Wednesday. It happened on Sunday. All is well. I told her, no, all is not well. My son is gone and gone for life. But she replied, no, all of us are praying for his recovery. And we were told he is responding to treatment. How would you wish him dead? But I replied, madam, I'm very sure my son is dead. Everybody is trying to keep it from me, but I know that my son is dead. My, the signs are very clear. My sister, who was with them, came down to the hospital facility that was managing my case to get some recommended materials, which was not available in the other hospital for their treatment. She came on that Wednesday and I asked questions about what quantity of material she needed, and she told me about it. 
She came again about four days later, and I asked her about the quantity of material she needed. She told me. But in my calculation, I saw that there was no even number set. If the number, if the quantity of material she was demanding for were to be divided into two, that made it also very glaring to me that only one person was still alive in that hospital. And I asked her why she would be keeping my son's dead away from me. But she assured me my son was alive. But I looked at her and told her, you can't be lying to me. He's my son. I know when he left me. He has left me. It's just God who can console me. But in that tragedy, the hand of God is, was very clear and was heavily felt. Ranging from our rescue to the case management in the hospital, God brought a lot of people to our aid. Otherwise, there was nothing that would have stopped the three children from roasting to ashes in the vehicle. Meanwhile, the other boy that was with me in the vehicle, our Jikatelem, who I said, circumstances made him my, my child. He told me that he was sleeping when the vehicle, when the headlong collision occurred. It was at the instance of the headlong collision, he woke up and saw fire coming from the front of the vehicle and he managed to escape through the windscreen. As he jumped down, he had some deep lacerations in the hand that almost condemned his left hand. I would not want to tell them that their brother was gone. A few moments before that time, they started a singing group two years before that accident, where the four of them would sing. Our Jikatelem, my late son Prince Ntoyem Gugunte, Esther, my younger brother's only child, and my first daughter, Prince, and my first daughter, Peace. It would be too devastating because the injury of Esther and Ekatelem were much more critical than me with regards to the percentage bonds sustained, save that I had fractures and lacerations which they did not have. So I wouldn't know how their emotions would be able to sustain in that difficult situation to break that news to them. So we made every effort to keep the news away from them and also to keep it away from my wife. All along, I will put up a bold face and pretend like all was well. Each time my wife will ask about the welfare of Prince, assurance will come from me and from the team managing him that he was fine, but I knew he was gone. At a point, I couldn't bear just basing my conclusion about my son's situation on what I got from the dream and from premonition. So I had to put the people taking care of my son on the spot when my wife was away, that they are lying to me. That if God allows it to happen, he will give me the strength to pull through. That why would they be telling me lies? It was at that instance, an elderly man and my younger sister started looking at one another with suspicions on their faces who among them would have broken the news to me. And I told them, no, I see suspicions in your faces. Don't suspect one another. None of you had told me, but I am only telling you that the two of you have conspired to lie to me about the state of my son. He's my son, I'm the father. Whatsoever the situation, no matter how terrible, I should know about it. It was at that point, the elderly man with my younger sister had to tell me that of a truth that Prince died the Monday after the accident at about a few minutes after 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And when I checked the time, it was about one hour and a few minutes after I made the prayer to God that if he would recover from this accident, vegetative, that God should please take away his life. But if God 
will heal him completely and he will come out strong and still be who he was, then he should be alive. And that was a few moments after that prayer. So I wept bitterly. The two of them made an effort to console me, calling some other people, and all of them made attempt to console me, to calm me before my wife would come back from where she had gone to to prepare food for us. On March 26, 2020, I was discharged to go home and to come back to the hospital for treatment as outpatient. It was on that day the news about our only son's death was broken to my wife. And it was a terrible moment for my wife. I felt for her the emotion of a mother. I remembered at that instance that in the hospital, after my son asked for his father and was, and was assured that the father is alive, he asked for the mother, said, where is my mother? They told him that the mother was around. He said, no, bring my mother to be by my side. When the mother got to the bed, he gathered all his strength and lifted up his head and said, Mommy, see me on. And he opened his two hands. And the mother wept with my wife's hand in my son's hand, scorched by fire, burnt almost beyond recognition. It was a moment after that I remembered all the memories started playing back that he was transferred to the hospital, to another hospital. Also, my wife beckoned to go with them, but they refused that she should come along with them. And I thank God for the good Samaritans that God used to take care of us. I remember that the first set of bills to be paid on that day, which was about 450,000 naira, approximately $1,000 was paid by people who gathered around that I wouldn't even know who they are. And that facilitated the transfer of my son and my lease to another tertiary health care facility. On that day, it was a terrible moment for my wife. And I had to offer a prayer that God should sustain my wife emotionally, physically and spiritually, because it was a terrible time. There was this situation that surrounded her, his birth. He was born when we lost our first child that God blessed his marriage with. So the coming of Prince was a great consolation for my wife. I also remember that Prince stood in a very unique birth position, being the first grandchild of my father. I'm very fond of my father. I also remember the first time we went home where he would tell my father, Grandpa, my father had told me a lot about your adventures with him on the river. Can you please take me to the river? And that was about some minutes after 10 p.m. in the night. And I remember the smile on my father's face telling my son, be calm, let it be daybreak. For sure, I will take you to the river. I remember the bonding between my son and my father. It was one of the greatest things that will hit my father. For over a year now, my father has not recovered from that shock. A lot of people were shocked. My immediate younger sister, upon hearing the news of the accident, slumped and became unconscious. She was discharged from the hospital a week after the accident. My, the third of our sisters in my birth series had to lock up her shop and relocate to be with us in the hospital. She was with us in the hospital until the last person was discharged, which was on the 26th of October, 2020. The other boy, Ikatelem, the situation of life made him to become my child, was a child born my, by my mother during her middle age. My father finished school 
finished from school early enough, at about the age of 21, and had a job that same year. As a promising young man, he had ventured marriage at the age of 22, when my mother was 17. When my mother was 18 and my father was 23, they had me as their first child. By the age of 13, my mother had stopped childbearing. But 13 years later, I had graduated from school and I was in youth service. There is this compulsory, voluntary service to the nation, which in Nigeria we call National Youth Service Scheme, which every graduate must offer the first year after graduation selflessly to Nigeria as our fatherland. I was enrolled in that scheme when I visited home and my mother had a baby boy. One and a half months later, the very healthy woman who was just moving from her shop, which was closely knitted to the sitting room, into the sitting room in an evening, slumped, and within 10 minutes, she was gone. In that circumstance, I had to go home to support my father, who was battered and torn apart by the incidents. We took our Jikatelem to a motherless baby home and registered, her, and registered him. On our way coming back, I felt so disturbed in my emotions. It was as if the boy was gone. As if if we had left him there, he would be dead. So I told my cousin who was with me that my emotions wouldn't let me be, that we should go back to that motherless baby home and bring the boy back home. But she asked questions like every other person would do. How will the boy be taken care of? Especially that the mother was no more. It's better we leave those who have known how to do this business and could do it professionally to take care of this child. But I was insistent, and we had to come back with the cartelem. Shortly after my mother's burial, I took a cartelem and myself to my service station. And from that one and a half months of age, a cartelem had been with me. Even in the accident, I remember when I limped to visit him in the ward with my crutches, he busted into tears and said, "Oh." Daddy, is this how you are going to be limping all the days of your life? Is it not better that instead of you to limp, that the pain should come upon me that I should die so that you'll be strong and healthy and to take care of my sisters and my brother Prince, not even knowing that Prince is gone. The bond between them was so strong that you can hardly recognize that they were born by a different set of parents. You will never know that they were an uncle and a nephew. They sang together in the same singing group. They were learning to play their violin together. They would run their keyboarding class together. They would do their voice training together. They would rehearse songs together. They would wash their clothes together. And it was a painful moment. I could barely control my tears. I had to excuse the word. In the incidence of the corona upsurge, we were asked to evacuate Esther from the other medical facility that she was referred to for treatment. And we were almost helpless. I was called upon again by the leader of the team, the leader of the medical team, to evacuate my daughter. My sister came helpless, telling me that some of the top medical personnel in that tertiary hospital, including some directors, contracted coronavirus, that the outbreak started, the spread started in an executive board meeting with somebody who came in, who flew in from outside for that meeting, bringing in the virus. We were helpless. But God, in his infinite mercy, provided a way out. As at that time, Esther has been scheduled for about three consecutive surgeries to intervene 
in her skin that were badly burnt. But, this, but the grafting would have to be suspended. And where is another competent hospital that will be so familiar with the history and will also offer a satisfactory service as was promising over there? That was another riddle to be solved. But I thank God for the people God also raised. I did not have their permission to mention their names. Otherwise, I would have. Some of the top executive personnel even offered to use their vehicles as ambulance to bring Esther to another medical facility. Meanwhile, even that medical facility has stopped admission because the strength of the medical facility available was getting exhausted, taking care of patients because of the corona incidents. A lot of primary health facilities had even been shut down, which created much more pressure on the very few tertiary health facilities. But thank God, who would always be God in every situation, who even in the deepest of the valleys would always make sure there is a light of hope. Esther was brought in. Some doctors offered to be available to manage her and to prepare her for surgery. Referral note was obtained from the hospital she was transferred from and she had a series of surgeries. Esther came back, Esther couldn't sit. Esther couldn't help herself to the toilet. It was a horrible moment. I watched Esther in pains and my mind would skip. I would shed tears behind the doors I will excuse myself from her word to cry bitterly. My little niece that left the house with me, healthy, nothing happened to her. Who had just decided to stay with me because of the bond between her and my children and the cattle, And they had formed a very strong, formidable team. And it brought me joy that this young generation of my father's lineage have learned to be together. Unity among people of close blood, which is a scarce thing to come by these days. And I was willing to make all the sacrifice to let that unity grow, even as all of them grow up and gradually will be happy that they are adults who are united in the family. I thought of all of those and Esther was helpless in bed. She will be helped in washing her mouth, in raising her up, in cleaning her up, in passing excrement, and it was a horrible moment. During the dressing of the wound, the tears and the pains, the groaning and the agony were overwhelming. They will overwhelm my emotions. But I thank God for people that God brought in. They were not professional psychologists, but they were experts in the job God has called them to do they form a strong wall of emotional support. It got up to a point where almost resigning to the fact that Esther would not grow, would not come out of the bed strong as she was, being able to walk. There were lots of medical examinations and the results were pointing that there were a strenuous growth in so many of her joints, blocking the joints, making the joints immovable. The doctors tried their best. It was almost to no avail. At that point, I had to call all my younger ones, everybody born of my father and my mother. We had to go to one of the branches of Seventh Adventist Church, and we declared a three days fasting and praying. On one topic, on one theme, God, please help that Esther will be able to walk, will be able to help herself, will return to school, can go to the toilet, can bathe by herself. That was our thing. We concluded that prayer. During the prayer time, there were tears of agony, tears of helplessness presented before God in faith with the simple prayer that we don't even know how to make very well. But do you know, three weeks afterward, Esther demanded that she wanted to sit up. Difficultly, and in pains. She managed with soft supports 
to sit in an inclined position. And that day was another day of joy. Like light trying to peep through the darkest part of the night just before the dawn, and all of us were elated. Few weeks afterward, like the sixth week after that prayer, I was visiting to bring some provisions to the world where they were. And I saw Esther with crutches. In her crutches, she was trying to do the exercise of a catalim throwing ball to her, and she trying to pick up the ball and throw back. I knelt down and raised my two hands in thanksgiving to the God of the universe. It was a miracle. She told me, Daddy, the other day, I beckoned in the catalim to assist me to the restroom so I can use the toilet. And he helped me and I used the toilet by myself. Though the pain was too much, but I had to use the toilet because people can keep taking care of me. And I marveled at the strength of emotion that this girl understand that she needs God to help her so that she wouldn't be a burden to people. And that alone was also an anchorage for faith and hope. And today, Esther has resumed school, although she has some limited angle of flexure in her, in her knee joint and one of her elbows had stiffened, but the other elbow is still flexible. Some of her fingers had also stiffened, but she's always very happy and enthusiastic. She has resumed school. She has also been positive to some extra classes being organized to help her catch up with the moment she was away from school, occasioned by the accident. I thank God who through it all has not let us lose hope. Four of us were involved in the accident, if not for God's intervention. Milder accidents than that, the entire family will be gone. But God has helped that not do a palatable experience, but three of us are still alive. That means all hope is not lost. I praise the God of heaven for all he has done. With God, nothing is impossible. One thing that will surprise you, if you had listened keenly, you will discover that this accident happened on the 2nd of February 2020 and I was discharged on the 26th of March. I remember one day I was walking along the streets of the university where I teach and a man drove past me and he reversed and stopped by and asked me, are you Gogonte? I said, yes, I'm Gogonte. Are you Gogonte or his spirit? I said, sir, I am Gogonte. You are Gogonte, walking on your feet, and he reversed. It was later I knew what he reversed for. He had a fracture a couple of weeks before mine, and he was still struggling to limp, and it was just at a single point. So he went to the doctor to ask, what is the extra thing you did to Gogonte that you, ref that you have refused to do to me? Look at me, I've been here before you, and my case is milder than his. But look at me struggling with crutches, managing to limp, and look at him walking without any support. And the doctor laughed, and the man became more serious. The doctor said, Gogonte is different, and you are different. I have tried everything possible I could do in your case, just like I had done to Gogonte and to all of my other patients. I have no preferential treatment, but only Gogonte and his God knows why his case is different. If you look at my appearance, you can imagine my age, almost in my 40s, and imagine that within seven weeks, I had multiple fractures, I had multiple dislocations, all on my lower limbs, and I will be able to walk without crutches in about eight weeks. If you will say that is not a miracle, what else would you call a miracle? We expended approximately six million naira in the medical care, which is approximately $12,000. On the day this accident happened, all I had on me was about 500,000 naira, which is approximately $1,000. 
fund had never stored any treatment we would want to get at any point in time. A lot of people donated. People who had never known me before donated. A lot of people came. I remember that day when I was taken to the x-ray room for x-ray examination. I saw a crowd outside, all of them looking in sympathy, some whispering prayers, some talking about how I am the cause of the accident. The following day, I overheard people talking from outside, not knowing that my head was laid very close to the wall of the hospital by the window. As they were discussing, one of them was talking about how I was responsible for the accident. But I thank God that the evidence is very clear. The police went to the scene of the accident, took the two vehicles to, the to their station, and did what they call an incident map, and discovered that there was nothing like a fault of mine that resulted into the accident, except that the other vehicle was on a very high speed and at a bend and was totally and had totally lost control of the steering. When I was trying to get over my wounds, trying to cope with my losses, I thought it's all about support from people. But to my surprise, a couple of people talked about how Ikatelem was the child I got before I got married to my wife. And I had to sacrifice Prince because I had already had this, a son elsewhere and kill him. And their justification was, how is it that only Prince will be lost? And everybody came out of the accident, though with scars, though with some level of deformation, but why would only Prince? Ikatelem had grown up to accept his faith, has loved me like his father, has seen me like his all in all. Some people are also talking to him to begin to see me like somebody who is strange to him, who has caused him pains. But I know that it was with a whole heart of sacrifice that I accepted the Catalan, that I nursed him. I sacrificed my career, I sacrificed my comfort, because I know my mother and my father had done more than that to raise me up to who I am. And if I will have the privilege to raise him, as God, as God wills, why wouldn't I give him my best? But I'm happy that God is still in control. Ikatelem has never for once seen me as a stranger. My sight brings Ikatelem joy. If I'm coming back from work, he will run, he will welcome me, he will collect my bag. He will ask me, Daddy, how is work today? Esther now stays with my younger sister, who is helping me to take care of Esther. But each time I visit, Esther will be happy. Esther will miss me if I have not visited up to a week and she sees me like her father. I thank God because the good work he has started in my father's family and in my family, he has never abandoned us. Although the devil has striking, but I know that through it all, we are victorious. As for me, the emotions could be heavy. I shed more tears for what people say and the, and the associated stigmas than for the death of my son. I remember the day I wailed aloud from my apartment, almost attracting the attention of the neighbors. And that was like six months after the burial of Prince. And nothing made me cry apart from people's attitude. While we have those on the positive side, we also have those on the negative side. But I thank God that all of these dynamics helps to strengthen us and helps to create a stronger us. Awesome.